Hello everyone, welcome to episode 13 of Floating Through Film. And this week we are concluding our series on Chaplin. And we're not talking about really any movies this week. We're just going to kind of go over Chaplin. We're going to, we have some questions we're going to answer that'll get us to talk about the movies in different ways. So before we get to that, let me introduce our host first, um, Luke. Hi. And Blake. What's up? And I thought the first question, we'll keep it simple to start with. And I'll ask it to you guys first before I go. Um, Blake, we'll start with you. Why do you why Chaplin? Why do you like Chaplin? Why should someone watch Chaplin? Should someone watch Chaplin? Where do you want to, you can take that question anywhere you want to go to. So all right, so I'll just say it, how, basically how I felt at the beginning of this and how I feel now okay. because I I I had watched two Chaplin movies. Yeah. I think I've said this before. I've watched two Chaplin movies before this, and now I have seen all of them. Like all of the ones he's directed, I've actually watched. And I didn't go into this month expecting that to happen. It just did kind of like you just, you just start got, you got I just got shorts. into it yeah. and then like the shorts are so easy to watch and they're so quick most of them that it's just like it's it's just it's very easy and I really love his features because those are just his shorts expounded upon made better and actually with real ideas and real like real social commentary in there and that's why I like love his features like his progression from his shorts to his features I love, and I honestly love that I watched everything for the for this because it's it's given me such like a great like I don't know perspective on just the man and how he changed throughout his career, and that would be the one thing I'd say for people who have, who haven't seen him. Like I'd start with some of the shorts, the shorts at least. You don't have to watch all of them, but like start with some of the shorts and then just see how the man progresses throughout his career because he he does change a lot. And, I mean, this man lived through two wars, two world wars, and you can see it in his movies, like, you can see the changes, the changes he, like, his views changing and stuff like that. But I would say the reason, the why Chaplin is, he's hilarious, he's easy to watch, and... I don't know. You can just you can spend an entire month and watch the whole thing. And it's, it's, you can watch all seventy something. It, it's movies. it's so fun. Like he he kind of restored my hope in humanity for like a little bit, honestly, because like just bit. because well, I mean, like because yeah. after 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 World War Two, he got like really cynical in his <laughs> movies. So I'm like, okay, like but before that, like his movies with the Tramp, they're all just about finding the goodness in humanity and like being good to each other. And I really love that message, and that's the message the world needs right now, honestly. And I think that's one reason why it connected with me more also, because I don't know, like, I, maybe I just need it at this point in my life. Oh, yeah. So that's why I'd say, with, of why Chaplin. <laughs> I like that. How about you, Luke? Why, um, why yeah, Chaplin? There, there's a lot of ways you can go with this, um, especially with someone like Chaplin. But generally what it comes down to for me, why I think people should watch him, is that it's just the way, the amount of things he could do uh, and make you feel mm. and make you... Just, yeah, make you feel basically without any words is honestly astounding. Like, obviously his later movies are also fantastic too, but mainly like uh, I'm talking more about silence here. Like, uh, he he like I think I've said this in an earlier episode. He he'll make you cry and make you laugh in the same you know scene or even yeah, yeah movie. You know, um, generally that's what it boils out to me boils down to me uh, for, and uh, also you know. Really, anyone could find anything out of Chaplin, I think, you know. Most likely, you'll find some redeeming quality about him that I think uh, you could take away He's from. He's got something for everyone. Yeah, pretty much. There's, like, a universal quality about Especially, it's like you are saying, his silence. Yeah. Um, yeah. They can be shown to any audience of any age. Yeah. Like they the, can get to it pretty quickly. Yeah. Any language. They don't really have to know the English language or anything. Yeah. Okay, let me go to... Let me say my... I guess... I have a lot of reasons written here, and I don't... I want to keep it short, so... Um, why I like Chaplin what I have written here is it's the way I think of Chaplin because I don't want to pick a single moment of his career because it almost feels like a short change in him you know and Blake oh, yeah. you guys both kind of mentioned this but, and Blake did too but I guess the main reason I like Chaplin is like the way I see his filmography is like if you like an album of music you really like right and, and really you like the whole album right you can't just pick specific songs or like even a uh, specific part of the album or anything, right? You like all the songs. Like this, that's how I feel about Chaplin's career. Like I like For his sure. career like an album, right? Yeah. And the different music, different songs have different, almost genres and different themes and different uh, you know words and everything. But you can tell they're all made by the same person. That's why I like him so much. Like the fact that he made Limelight and he made 
you know, Mabel Strange predict the same guys uh, yeah. in Mabel Strange predicament. Like, I like that it's the same person, but it's all different types of genres, all different types of jokes, really low moments, really high moments, you know, like all yeah. that kind of creativity. And I guess uh, that's really what I have written down is I like the creativity you see in all Chaplin's movies. This yeah, kind of, uh, sure. And that's definitely, I, you recognize that in the Tramp himself as a character. And what I have written down here is, uh, especially for the Tramp, is his creativity and being alive, like, in the moment, right? He's always in the moment. He's, like, almost to a fault, right, where he's not concerned with what's going to happen in the future. He's just like, oh, as long as this works now, you know, I'm going to stick with it until something goes (laughs) wrong, and then he has to go move on to the next thing, right? Yep. But he's still always in the moment in that creativity. Yeah, Yeah, and also, another thing that really highlights the creativity is how many shorts he made. (laughs) Oh, that alone, yeah, (laughs) Yeah. like, because a lot, like, uh, probably 50 shorts... Cause you, more than oh, it's more than 50. Yeah. It's like 60? It's like probably 60 to 70. Okay. Because yeah. he made, what, like 10 features maybe? Yeah, I think it's 11. And at least on Letterboxd, he has like 70 movies that he directed. So he's probably done like 55 to 60. Yep, yep. Yeah. And there yeah. were probably some lost. I think they and he, he definitely the, didn't uh, lose as much as like other silent, silent creators because he actually cared for and preserved his film. Yeah. But he, there are still some some that are lost. No, one. Only one. Only lost. one. Yes, only one. That's what's crazy about Chaplin. That only one uh, short got lost from him, and that kind of speaks to how impactful even people thought he was at the time. Yeah. You know, like a lot of most silence got lost because you know people thought they weren't you know histor- going to be historical movies some days or something yeah. like that. But no, and I mean that's why that's why like his uh, United Artists, just him starring that with like I, I don't like D.W. D- 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 Griffith that much, but like at least. They created like him, D.W. Griffith, and I think one other person I can't remember. Uh, Mary Pickford and Douglas yeah, Mary Pickford. Yeah, so like those four people like started this thing where where like artists could just come and create art. Yeah, and, like they, they understood. They their own production studio, yeah, they understood. You know? They understood at the beginning that they needed the, they needed control to make mm-hmm. things that they actually thought were art. Yep. And that's what their movies are as art. Like the the industry back then didn't really see it that way, like you said. So. And and that kind of goes back to how what I was saying at the beginning of why I like Chaplin so much. It's the fact that, um, and that's really important related to what you were saying about how I was talking about the album, um, how his career is like an album, it's really important to know that he had control basically over all the songs yeah. in that album, right? Where oh, like, yeah. Yeah. Uh, what, spoiler, we're going to talk about Keaton next week a little bit, but yeah. you know, that's what happened to Keaton, right? He signed with the studios, and for a long time the studios had control over what kind of content oh, yeah. he was, or content, content. Uh, <laughs> what kind of movies he was putting out, though, yeah. right? Um, yeah, and then that led, that did but that is kind of a... It did lead to him st- uh, being in Limelight, though. <laughs> okay, yes. Okay, yeah. yeah. No, but I'm, I just want to mention that, yeah. Chaplin, from a very early... Basically, when he started doing his shorts, he realized how important that creative control was to uh, even filmmaking, right? Yeah. And at the time, most people did not think of it like movies like that, right? They didn't think mm-hmm. of them as, as art. And from a very uh, early time in Chaplin's career, he saw how comedy could be art, could be art even in film form, right? Where most comedies in film or even... Uh, you know, in the music halls and everything was just slapstick, right? Yeah. It wasn't supposed to be serious art like uh, other art was. But he, from an early time, saw, you know, his comedies are like music. You know, they're like music or dances, you yeah. know? And that's kind of like, uh, that's another po- kind of point I wanted to mention why I like him so much is, um, especially going through it this time, was seeing how he took a lot of old traditions, right, of mime and yeah. uh, music hall uh like a music hall theater basically and put that in his movies but he did it in at the time a very new way yeah. right like uh it's so weird to think about Chaplin as like a, an innovator right because we're just like when you think of it as a movie initially you just think of like the camera very still and you're like yeah. watching a joke take place right and there's a lot more going on once you realize how like smooth his movies feel throughout all of them how perfectly edited they are yeah you know how each like how the emotions flow the right way where it's like a sad scene and then a happy scene and he basically knows how he's guiding your emotions the whole yeah. way i mean just the fact that he composed all of his movies is insane too so oh yeah the music for them right like like yeah. whenever you whenever you think of directors you don't think of them composing their own music you know because it's just two completely separate th- th- i mean not completely separate obviously but it's just two two like different skill sets and yeah. the fact that his like scores are just so insanely good and they match his movies perfectly. I mean, they could only do that because he knows what he wants to put in there. Yeah. there and he's other... musically talented enough to do that because a lot of people just aren't musically talented enough to compose their own music. Yeah. Like, it's crazy. I'm trying to think of, like, how many directors actually 
have done that. I know Saihi Ray did. Oh that. yeah, you know I had to yeah. mention that. I had to mention that. It can't happen that often. Like it doesn't happen, more, that, like, it doesn't more, happen but... that often though. Yeah, I, think, I mean, like, yeah, definitely it's still. John Carpenter. He does do some of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he, he has some great scores. Yeah, so, some yeah. amazing no, scores and bangers. No, it's like it's just that aspect of a director being like, yeah, I have to control every part of this. Yeah, it has to be like I know what I want, you know, and um. It's kind of what I love about Chaplin, like, he had that kind of, uh, we have to do 50 takes about, you know, to him, that kind of, you can tell, especially in his earlier movies, or his silence, where everything is perfectly one mm-hmm. to the next, like, he had to have that kind of mania about him, right? But, um, I like how much that shows in his movies, and yeah. like you were saying with the music especially, but everything has to, I just like the fact that it's from his brain, you know, you can tell everything has to be from him. Yeah. It has to be perfect. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Let me mention one other thing that I really wanted when I think about the Tramp, especially, but just Chaplin as a whole, and why I love these movies is uh, Blake kind of mentioned in his opening thing was um, that kind of hopefulness you get from watching these movies. But to me, it's not like uh, it's not a fake hopeful- hopefulness. No. And the reason I say that, especially um, with a lot of his shorts, or not a lot of his shorts, but uh, a lot of his silent features, is that dual nature of society beating down on the tramp kind of thing but then the reason the tramp is able to get through it is because of the love that he has for usually a woman yeah. but it's really just supposed to represent how, what love is supposed to do in spite of that yeah right and that's where you get that hopefulness from right and what i like is he's still honest about what the world is like yeah because yeah. a lot of movies would be like oh see the world changed for them and that's why they got happy right but it really doesn't ever really happens like that like in a lot of the movies the tramp still gets kind of a bad ending but it's hopeful because he has that love yeah right? Or at least he understands. He still yeah. has that love for the world. And one of my favorite moments of that is in City Lights, where uh, the rich guy who's supposed to have everything, he's the one about to commit suicide, and the yeah. tramp, you know, the one who's been like beat down, he's the one telling him like, "No, you uh, tomorrow the birds will sing. You have to live yeah. another day." That kind of thing. Yep. And that happens throughout a lot of his movies, right? Those... There's always the, like, why is the you know the guy who's least in society? Why is he the one giving the speech of you know you should be hopeful, a life is worth living? You know? Yeah. And I just love that. I love those little moments throughout all of his movies, but yeah. I mean, because you even get that in Limelight, but it, it's not from the Tramp, but you still get yeah. it. Yeah, like... it was from the Tramp to begin with, and then. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, that's true. And then he got beat down <laughs> again. What else, dude? What else do you guys uh, want to talk about, Chaplin overall? Uh, no, nothing. I do. Okay, <laughs> I, 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 right I do. Now. Maybe I'll mention some more things I have, and you, we can go off there. Like another thing I really like about Chaplin is obviously the comedy but specifically his kind of theory of comedy. And I wanted to mention a little quote that he has in his autobiography that uh, I really think is awesome. It's pretty short, I'll, I'll read it. So quote, in the creation of comedy, it is paradoxical that tragedy stimulates the spirit of ridicule because ridicule, I suppose, is an attitude of defiance. We must laugh in the face of our help- helplessness against the forces of nature or go insane. And basically saying, as, you know, comedy is kind of uh, the way humans can be defiant towards you know the forces of nature that are against us right oh, yeah. and that can be society industry you know modern you know modernization all these kind of things like he's showing how comedy is just a way to kind of fight back against that it is. and a lot of his movies are like that right those kind of representations of that right yeah. it, they're still honest about the world or how brutal it can be but you can still laugh right yeah. they are like the, the ending of Cir- the ending of the circus is like just like that yeah Yep. Just circus. getting completely left behind, but he still has that hope just because it's like, oh, it just happened again. He walks modern times, too. Yeah, yeah modern I, times, too. Yeah. I do love how his signature ending of the tramp walking away from the camera. I think that's a really mm-hmm. nice touch that he it is. Definitely, he uses it, ends it very well, too, with modern times, I think. Modern times, yeah. the circus. Yeah. Those but specifically, modern right? times when like he's finally walking away with another person, basically. Yeah. It's a great ending for the mm-hmm. tramp character. Yeah. Uh, okay, so before we get to the questions. There's one more thing I wanted to mention, and it kind of relates to what this podcast is, we're going to lean to a lot, is I like, and I've mentioned it throughout, you know, I mentioned the whole album metaphor and everything, is I like how per- the personality of Chaplin is so directly involved in his movies, Yeah. right? And, you know, French New Wave, we were just talking about, you know, uh, um, author theory, not, you know, authorship of a movie and stuff, but the fact that Chaplin was so early on realizing how much control he was supposed to, he needed to have over his movies... And that's, to my, in my opinion, anyway, that's why they've lasted so long, right? You can tell yeah. this is from a singular vision person, right? It's not a studio produced yeah. kind of thing that was made just for a certain audience at a time. And um, I have to read one more quote from his autobiography that I've been kind of like, basically, 
sums him up in, in a perfect way. I'm surprised that some critics say that my camera technique is old-fashioned, that I have not kept up with the times. What times? My technique is the outcome of thinking for myself and of, of my own logic and approach. It is not borrowed from what others are doing. And, like, Chaplin's one of the best examples of that because he literally was one of the first. Yeah. Right? So you can't say, oh, he was, you know, secretly borrowing from all these directors yeah. and just not taking credit. No, he literally was one of the first. He was there when film was first starting yeah. as a medium, you know? So he was one of the pioneers. All these techniques he's doing is, like, so when people call him, you know, old-fashioned, it's like, I'm just doing what I've always done, that kind of thing, right? Yeah. And you can see that uh, even in his talkies, right? Like, they don't feel exactly like how a talkie was, like, in no. the 40s or 50s, right? You can still tell it's, like, this is Chaplin's version of a talkie, and it's silent in a lot of ways still. It is, yeah. But any, anything you guys want to add to that before we get to questions? Or? No, that was really well, that was really well said. <laughs> right, right, right. Okay, go off, Danny. Go off, Danny. <laughs> yeah, you know I have You got all the quotes from the outline. <laughs> yeah, I do. But, uh, yeah, we'll get more into the movie specifically now. By answering some of these questions, we thought we'd go from not least interesting, but questions we'll answer faster to, you know, maybe ones we'll spend more time on. So, let's start with, what's your favorite set piece? Favorite set from the movie? What do you guys think of first? Blake? Yeah, I was hoping you wouldn't start with me, because I want to know what Luke was going to choose, so I didn't steal his. Oh, you better mm. not steal mine. Oh. I think I'm going to choose the Circus Wire <laughs> for my favorite set. Oh, okay, okay. Like... Oh, yes. It was honestly just insane. I don't even know exactly how they did it. Like, obviously, he was attached, at least at the very beginning, because that's how he was actually performing the, the, the like, tightrope yes. walk. Like, that's how he's actually performing it in the movie. Like, that's how he was actually supposed to be doing it. But then he loses that, t the, like, anchor he was on, and I just don't even know, like, did he just completely that's a good walk question. a tightrope? Or something like I don't know what happened at the end of this. Like, like but the set is just insane because it's an actual tightrope. I'm pretty sure because they show him on the tightrope multiple that's times. A, I want to like, really film that. Now. Yeah, like I really want to know how I filmed it. But it's just like it was a really great set. Had a really great payoff. <laughs> and <laughs> that was my favorite set. Okay, that's so. cool. okay. Well, you, what about you, Luke? Uh, mine's interesting because it's actually from a movie of his that I wouldn't consider my top tier uh, of his movies. Uh, it's from the Gold Rush, uh, The Cabin. Is the set piece I was thinking of, specifically two parts of that movie. Okay. Uh, the set piece of the cabin when the when they open the door and the wind yeah, keeps yeah, blowing yeah, them yeah, out. Yeah. That was really cool. And then especially uh, when I forgot how it happened, but when they when the when the when the house is on the ravine basically yeah. and like it's tilting back and forth. It just and got the blown there by the wind. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> when, they, when they go to sleep like drunk or something. Yeah. yeah. And then like yeah. I, just, I thought that was super creative and interesting and uh, that's insane. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, that's definitely one of the bigger ones you think of too. That yeah. cabin. Yeah. No, that how they made it tilt and how they made it look like it was yeah. tilting and everything. It, 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 it shows it's like it's basically like a character in the movie. Honestly. Yeah, it, it shows it so much. Yeah. yeah, that cabin. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, it is because they go back to it multiple or at least one other time. Yes, yeah. they do. Um, okay, let me. Yeah, and that kind of because that leads to mine kind of because mine is the other big set piece that a lot of people would probably think of a Chaplin is. Uh, the gear scene in modern times. I always I, picked I, that. Yeah, so. I'm glad that someone picked it. It just that's the, that's basically what I think of when I think of Chaplin first. You know, it's just him stuck in those gears. You know, it's like it shows so much just from a joke, right? It like does. literally, the tramp cannot. He literally cannot fit in with this kind of factory uh, modernization of society. No. Kind of thing, you know? Honestly, you could say the whole factory from modern times. Yes, to be honest. Oh, all of them. Like yeah, yeah like. I just had to pick one. I wanted to pick yeah, one set that, piece thing, so I picked that one. I'm surprised but... you didn't choose the rink or like him skating and that set piece in uh, in modern times, Luke. Skate. Oh, I mean, yeah, I'm, that, that's, that's definitely up there. Just considering I that's don't... a really good set. So I didn't even think about that, but like, and, yeah, and the fact that that connects to the rink too. That makes yeah. it good as yeah. well. But... I did have one short on my on my short list at least, and it was Shanghai, <laughs> where he's just oh, like tilting around. Like this is one of his list. better boat, his better like oh, boat scenes know. and stuff yeah. like that. I, I think don't the know immigrant does it. Immigrant has the best boat scene though. It's got really when, when it's like yep. the immigrant yeah. looks, like the food, like they're like yeah, staying like, the food. Or just the fact, well, the, okay, we'll talk about the immigrant coming okay. up. So coming yeah. up. <laughs> Spoiler alert! But uh, let's go to the next question I had. Um, best female lead or best female performance. Wherever you want to go with that, who's the best female late, uh, person in this movie? Yeah, we might pick all the same one here. That's what I'm concerned about. I don't know. You think so? Okay, I don't you, know. Go you go first. first. You, yeah. You're not the most sure. I'm not even okay. kind of sure yet. That's why. Oh, um, well, I picked Paulette Goddard from Modern Times. Oh, okay. I feel like this one's. I I, I thought she was mostly the no-brainer was the best performance in the. Okay, actually, you know, what? I didn't think about what you guys might choose. Anyway, yeah, I don't. Yeah, I mean, 
I don't even know what there is to say about it. I mean, it's why do you like? Why do you think it's? Why why did you think it was obvious? Because obviously, uh, the, the, like I kind of see what you're saying. There is a big yeah. difference between hers and maybe some of the other yeah. ones. Yeah, I think it's. Uh, I think it's just the way she portrays, uh, you know, a person who's willing to, her willingness to fight uh, for the betterness of her life and the tramps, which I find so appealing to me, uh, especially this time watching it. And uh, like uh, we mentioned that in our review, they yeah. are very similar. They're the most similar. Yeah, and um, and it, I could definitely see why people think it's a bit overbearing. Honestly, I think in the Great Dictator, her character kind of. Her acting in movies a bit over the top compared to modern times, which, oh, yeah. but yeah, that's why I really, I just, uh, yeah, pretty much. Right. <laughs> uh, do you have yours, Blake? Or because I know mine. I have mine. Okay, so what mine's uh, <laughs> mine's Claire Bloom from Limelight. So oh, oh okay, damn, okay. I didn't even expect that. No, I really love her yeah. in Limelight because it's just the fact of like her acting and knowing deep down like because you can see it in her face you can see that she loves charlie chat like she loves um calvero mm -hmm. and that's chaplin <laughs> yeah, she, lo she loves she loves she loves chaplin the movie she loves charlie and but she loves him out of a place of pity and you can see that in the character and i think she portrays it really well and her like she plays off of chaplin very well i think also like i think i buy that they do love each other on like a plutonic level at least like they do like have an emotional love for each other but it can't like like she know like for her it's out of a place of pity for Chaplin it's not like for Chaplin it could be out of a place of like real love but he just doesn't like he it's it's a thing that in a lot of his movies where he loves the woman so much that he wants the best for her mm -hmm. and not for himself yeah and that I think I just think that their dynamic is really great in the movie and, I, and she that, does a good job of like she does almost playing that gray area between love and pity she does you know where you can't tell for a lot of the movies yeah and it's just like the ending with her just with it just camera lingering on her and ending with her like it's a beautiful ending until i mean i i just i think she's my favorite actress okay okay so so i'll go to mine i'll may i kind of i guess the way i'll answer it is just my favorite female performance or female lead in the chaplin movie is the one that he's not in is a one i have to mention okay. a woman in paris a woman in paris because yeah, i mean uh it is kind of sad that Anna Permanence didn't get like a huge career after this because that's kind of why he made the movie he was hoping he could get she could get a career out of this yeah and she deserved one but, and that's why that's really what's sad because I think she's pretty she's pretty great in this movie she is and like it's one of the more you know basically one of his more serious movies kind of you know compared to most of his comedies um I just think she does a great job and it kind of gets under like you could see why people would be like oh this is a Chaplin movie that's you know he's not in it I'll kind of just skip that one kind of yeah. thing right where it's like don't skip it's it. not it's not what's just for her performance especially the ending of this one you know we talked about it obviously on the episode you'll have to, you'll have to go back and listen if yeah. you want to hear us talk about the ending but just her uh the way she shows different kind of naturalistic emotions right it's like one of the first movies where you get kind of naturalistic acting in silent movies where a lot of it was very expressionistic like expressionistic at the time this one the emotions are very underplayed and they're very subtle and that's why i think she does a really great job throughout the movie of doing that and it's you know Chaplin proving he could just direct yeah. a non-comedy kind of serious dramatic movie for the first time, and he chose Edna Permanent to do that, which is yeah. and the title movie. alone, the title and the poster alone are great as well. So that's my pick. No one chose City Lights. Dude. I know. I think, I think <laughs> she was too. my second choice for that. But yeah. Like, yeah. She probably would have been my second choice too, honestly. She so. was my <laughs> so okay. second, bro. Uh, Number two. Oh, hey, that's not, uh, that's yeah. not bad. At least we all pick different ones. That's true. <laughs> uh, let's go to the next question. Favorite score. Blake, how about you? I think you had yours. Limelight. Okay, limelight. Okay, yeah. And I think me and Luke got the same. Probably. Modern I mean, times. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay, so well, nice, we'll, start nice. we'll start with limelight. No, limelight. Uh, it's it's honestly, I honestly think it's my favorite score just because it's the most memorable memorable to me. Like I I whenever I think of limelight, I think of the score playing over the ending, and I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> like yeah. it's one of the it's one it's not the only reason that that ending connects, but oh my god, like the music plays it a heavy connects. factor. Oh, it does. Like it plays a heavy factor on why that connects at the very end. Like it's it's such a beautiful score throughout the entire thing, not just the ending, obviously. Like it plays throughout the entire thing, and I really love it a lot. Like. It just connects. It just makes the it makes the emotions connect a lot, more, bitter, a lot harder. That, like bittersweet you know? feeling. Yeah, of, does a great job. He pulls that. on your heart. He literally tugs at your heartstrings. You know. 
he knows how to do it with his with all of his scores, but but yeah. that one I think I think that's like the epitome of his I scores agree. in my opinion. But Cause, yeah, that's definitely one of my favorite. We'll, we'll just talk. What, what about Modern Times score? Luke? Well, the whole score is amazing, but the one piece of it that like is the most memorable to me that like it's the main reason why I like love this score is uh it's the track called uh it's called it's called Smile. He uses it multiple times in the movie. He uses it in the scene where, um. I think it's it's either the dream sequence when they're seeing the house or uh, when they when they get into the something to do with the house. Okay. okay, okay. Um, he also plays it during the ending. I'm pretty sure. Uh, yeah, I, I don't, it's hard to describe what it yeah, sounds it like, sound but... like. But yeah, he uses it really well. Yeah, because like, for me it's kind of different reasons. Like I love the score and like uh, the reason why I want to pick this is two two instances. It's definitely all the music he uses in the factory. Like one of them is called like lunchtime or something I think that's one of the songs yeah. or something I think it's just called Lunchtime that score is amazing um, how the score just fits the mood of the feeling of a factory almost you know oh like, yeah the score in the factory the way they amazing. walk yeah. and everything it yeah. just fits that kind of like uh, up and down kind of yeah. thing uh, perfectly you could definitely tell so the person who made that score knew what he was doing yes, to yes. do the movie yes, yes obviously yes. Chaplin did yeah so. And then, uh, I don't know if this counts as score, but, you know, obviously the ending musical song yeah, of, yeah. The, of Modern Times, where he sings so for the first time. Oh, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. That's probably on the soundtrack, right? Like, it will count. It will we'll count. It. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's the reason why I pick it, because it's, like, one of my favorite tramp moments ever, so. You know, the tramp singing for the first time, just, like, basically gibberish, but the song still sounds good. Sounds amazing. Um, yeah. It's just a perfect, uh, I'll count it as a score, so that's why it's for me anyway. A score. Let's go to the next question. Um... Funniest movie. Okay, so for me, um, the funniest movie for me is definitely The Circus. Uh, I am going to talk about it a lot later. Uh, so just one thing, one funny moment that really stood out to me that uh, I'm going to bring up is uh, the opening scene. Specifically, like, uh, the Mirror May scene and uh, the part of the scene where he uh, uh, he's basically, you know, he's running from the guy who's, wanting to go after him and yeah, the, he uh the they're on this like what, what would you even call it like a it looks like an amusement park yeah amusement park kind of thing uh, like electronic and, uh, animatronic set yeah and he, he basically like acts like he's one of those uh animatronics yeah. animatronic kind of thing yeah. where he's like just going back yeah. and forth yeah, like yeah. rotating i think like he's obviously an inanimate animatronic mm -hmm. and uh the guy who's chasing him like can't seem to find where he is, and then the police come up chasing that guy. Is that that guy also acts like a yeah. uh, animatronic thing? And then, and then, and then Chaplin takes the opportunity to smack him in the head yeah. every time yeah. he turns. Like, it's just he kind of just builds so much on. It builds the because it's it, like starts, it starts. Yeah. It starts, it starts other, with right? him in like the mirror maze, yeah. and the cop the cop actually chases him first, and then okay, the other guy okay, starts yeah, chasing yeah, him yeah, as well. Because uh, the first time Charlie acts like a like an animatronic. Is not with the guy there. It's just because the cop was there and like he's just acting oh, like the animatronic. Okay. And then the other guy comes up and then like Charlie act. points at the cop down there at the uh, down at the wharf okay, or whatever. Yeah, and true. then like they both start acting. And then yeah, he takes the opportunity to start hitting him on the head. That's just so funny, dude. Oh my god, I had that for one of my best guys. And sure. that kind of just leads to mine too, because my funniest movie is also The Circus. Yes, and like for me, it's it's not even because of a specific gag really. It's like to me, this is really just at least of the features for sure. It's just straight up he's trying to be funny for most of the movie oh, you know yeah. it's like it's less it's less about the story or about the ideas than even I mean, some of the other ones right it's like straight up like end to end his funniest movies like his funniest gags you know scene to scene it's 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 for the sake of the gags almost a lot of them yeah and i guess uh i'll mm -hmm. mention at least one that sticks out for me is just the lion scene where he gets yeah. stuck in the cage with the lion just a great great moment and it just I don't it, it almost feels like a short change just by mentioning one in the circus because there's so many. Oh, yeah. oh, I yeah, guess there's that's so like many. I've been saying it's that's what kind of the movie, this one is about more than some of his other features. So, but yeah, definitely the circus that was my funniest, and maybe kind of related to that is if it's like if you're just bored and you want to and you're, you're tired and you just want to watch a Chaplin movie that's you know quote unquote a, you know if someone was thinking of a Chaplin movie yeah. like you just kind of want to relax this might be the movie I would turn on. That's you know one of the reasons why it's. Probably my favorite chaplain. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. Spoiler alert. No. Spoiler yeah. Alert. I mean, yeah. But yeah. But yeah. But yeah. Yeah. I knew we were gonna talk about that. Yeah. I, I, and it's like, that's why I was, you know, mentioning when I was mentioning the album thing. Like, this would be like if I wanted to listen to a pop song because I was just kind of, you know, like wanted to be in a good mood kind of thing. That's fair. Uh, this would be my my chaplain pop song, you know, where it just it gets me in a. a good oh mood, yeah, for right? sure. For like, sure. You don't, it's not as like deep or serious or even. 
uh, uh, you know, emotional on some of his other ones. Yeah. But it's also why I love it. It's, yeah, it's so good. But what about you, Blake? What about what's your what what's your funniest? Circus is definitely up there. It's probably the second funny, or maybe it, it might be the first. But I think Modern Times is one of his funnier ones. I won't say funniest because like it, it's it's like Circus and Modern Times are both up there for me. Like they can change on any, on any day, and honestly, it's just because of all the like. It's just because of all the short ideas, short ideas he uses in modern times. It's just so funny, like because especially for people like Danny and I that have seen most of his shorts, like the like the modern modern times, the last half of that movie where it's just him doing all of his shorts, basically, it yeah. makes Call the movie very. It just makes the movie very funny. And, and like, even the scene, the factory feels like a short. It does, honestly, oh, yeah. yeah. Like it, like that that movie also plays yeah. kind of like a gag movie in some ways, I but know. I mean that one also has like. A hard societal message yep, that people yeah. can see very, oh, very. He's not very subtle about it. I don't yeah, think, no, but no. <laughs> maybe, maybe some people think he's subtle about it. But he's subtle about it in terms of like he's never directly telling you what it's about. Yeah. But it's just so. The image it's just so obvious. It. Yeah, <laughs> just so obvious. The stories about it, everything's all obvious about it. Yeah. You don't have to directly say it in the movie. But I think that's why right now I think modern times would be like what I would consider maybe his funniest, is oh, just okay. because. I love I love how he expounded on his short ideas they had with yep. Keystone S and A first or mutual and first yep. national I, like it's so funny like I because like, these are the better versions of those shorts I think so so let's go to honestly I saved the favorite gag question because I thought this was honestly a, a better question the funniest movie it's a good one what's your favorite gag what's the one that sticks out in your head um well um, mine okay yeah um mine's also, also from, the from the circus <laughs> uh funny enough um. And specific, specifically, it's the scene where you know when he gets the he where he accidentally gets the job with the circus because uh, or as, as a performer I should say at the circus because his initial job was just to clean up in between the acts, but uh, then when he you know is you know being the tramp and messes up he saw him actually messing up and it being really funny the crowd really likes it so basically the circus owners should manipulate this and just send him out there every time. And uh, it gets to the point where, like, during the actual performances, the crowd would basically be like, "This sucks. Bring on, bring yeah, on the yeah, funny yeah. man," you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's, I think it's hilarious. And just like the fact that he's so clueless that he's the star. Yeah, like, it's just it's such a tramp thing. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but and it's honestly it, what I love about that. Like, I guess that kind of whole gag too is um he. The, the second he starts to realize he's a star is when he starts to lose the job, you know? Yeah. yeah. Like, the whole time he's, like, yeah. he's the job is when he doesn't know. Like, that's when he's yeah. the star, right? It's, like, just part of the uh, part of the tramp. Like, things can never go exactly right for him. Yeah. <laughs> Once he knows he is, a, uh, he is a success, he can never be a success yeah, after that. Yeah, so. he, yeah the, the circus has to move on. Yeah. Point, you know? Um, what about you, Blake? What's your favorite gag? This one's definitely a harder question because yeah, there are so many great gags so in all of his ones, movies. Yeah. I think the one I'm going to choose, and it's because I love his dream sequences, yep. I think I'm going to choose the bear sequence in oh, The Gold Rush, okay. dude. Because, oh. like, Charlie dresses in, like, a bear fur coat or something, and the other and his, the other guy that's in the cabin, that's stuck in the cabin with him, is so hungry yep, yep. <laughs> that he thinks Charlie is an actual bear and hallucinates yep. that he's an actual bear. And so he's chasing him around with a gun, trying to kill him, and then Charlie gets, ends up getting the gun from him, and then he's like... Yeah, yeah. Sleeping up, he's sleeping with his like hands yeah. in his shoes, with his gun like right there, and watching the other guy not sleeping at all. Yeah. I just love that entire sequence because it plays into like why I love his dream sequences. Like he has so many great dream, dream sequences, but it's just his. It, it's one of his funnier gags in my opinion. And what I uh, honestly, the gold, the gold Rush has some bigger gags. Like the, he has some it funny does. gags in the Gold Rush. So and that one specifically is so good also because um, he kind of got that joke at least probably is when he read about. Uh, the jet, the Dahmer party, like what, yeah. uh, what, partly why he wanted to make the Gold Rush was, you know, reading about the Dahmer party when they had to eat a bunch of people. Yeah. And that's just like a funny take on that, right? Yeah, like, it is. Uh, it did happen. Like that's partly why I got the uh, idea for the movie was people getting so cold out there that they had to eat each other. Yep. And he like makes it, and that's a you know classic chap and then he makes a joke out of it. Yeah, because I can't. I think it was after that, after the bear scene happened, where he cooked the shoe. Because <laughs> he had yeah, both yeah. of his shoes oh, on whenever, whenever he was like in the bear oh, scene, and then they, they cooked the, the other shoe. guy's like, and he's just yeah. like acting like it's normal. Yeah. You know, he's like, oh, it's like he does it all the time. <laughs> and the other guy's like, they're just like watching him. And he's yeah. Like, I guess. Like, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love that. Um, I'll pick my favorite, and I have like a few written down, and. But okay, I'll just pick one. I'll just say one, and maybe I'll mention the other ones later if I if I remember. But the one I I just have to pick because it's 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 like one of the moments that I think of uh, when I think of Chaplin is 
the, the moment in The Immigrant um, where they find out where they, where they see the Statue of Liberty the first time on the boat and you know it's, it's really hopeful and the, yeah. the music is playing and then all of a sudden the next shot is literally uh, them getting rounded up like cattle yeah. it's just like it's just like a great dichotomy just a funny little gag too and then he kicks the immigration officer and everything just, yeah he does it's just a great like a swing of emotions it is and, and that, some of his great gags have that right like just kind of like you don't know where your emotions are going in the moment when he's doing the gag like, yeah and some great social commentary yep exactly and the commentary on top of that yeah that's obviously a, that's just the reason I had to pick that but some other ones I had, and let's just mention some really quick ones, because obviously, like, oh, like I said, there's sure. so many. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mention some quick ones, but I'll, I'll mention some that I had written down also. The pawn shop alarm clock scene. Yes. The shoulder arms tree scene. Yes. Oh, yeah. I had that one. Uh, yeah. One of them I, I kind of want to just mention, too, the, the city light scene where he goes to pick up a cigarette. Uh, the yes, cigar, no, I the love that butt, scene, dude. Yeah, uh, after he's driving the car. And he's literally in a Rolls Royce, and then he kicks over a bum to pick up a cigar. Yep, exactly. Great guy. The boxing scene from the lights. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Great. I have the I'm boxing scene of the kid, too, because that one's hilarious, too. Oh, yeah, also. Where yeah. he's just taking bets on his kid because yep, he yep. knows he's winning. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, the last one I had was uh, the gold rush with the bread rolls. Yes, where he does yes. the dream sequence with the, the dancing with the yes. bread rolls. That's a, just an amazing classic moment, too. Eating Machine and Martin Times is also one of his better gags. So. But get them out now. Forever. Get them out now. Forever, forever now. Forever hold hold your peace. What else? Yeah. Do you have any more gags? I mean, honestly, the lion. You watch way more than I do. Honestly, too, the so. lion gag in the circus is just impressive because, like, why? Like, like I said in my review, I was like, I was literally screaming at my TV, like, why are you doing this? You literally made it already. Like, you don't have to lock yourself in a cage with a lion for like a hundred takes or whatever. It was. Like, that took a long time. I literally wrote online that oh, it took really? like like close to a hundred takes, and I, like I was like, why is this man doing this? Like, and, and the, he doesn't need to. And the part, and that's literally kind of mentioned. It kind of happens in the movie itself, where he goes back in the cage to impress her. Yeah, 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 he does. Like, and then he has to run to go and finally attacks her. That literally happens in the movie too. And the way that scene ends, where he runs all the way up the light pole too. Yes, yes. (laughs) Uh, Just a whole great scene. No, that's why I was saying, like the gags in his shorts. There are so many, just so many great gags in his shorts that it would just take way too long to mention. That's why, that's why I tried to bring up at least Shanghai with the boat scene. Yeah, you brought that one. Like I tried to bring that up because I really like that one. We also need to mention the opening scene in City Lights. Where yes. uh, I mean it's it's kind of a gap but kind of not where I just thought it was cool how you know how he all the people were speaking or like their voices yeah. oh, like, yeah, the, the voice too yeah, yeah like his first thing. sound picture basically yeah, yeah. like basically saying like these people what they're saying is yeah, garbage yeah. like what the stupid <laughs> but uh, yeah I think we mentioned a lot of them let's go to our our final two questions uh, favorite short we'll start with that one we're basically favorite short and then favorite movie coming up next but favorite short first. Uh, we'll we'll save for Blake for last on because he's <laughs> the, he's the short expert. Yeah, short expert. Short expert. <laughs> uh, Luke, what's what's, uh, what's the favorite, favorite short? Or what's my, like something someone should watch if they wanted to watch? That? Um, well, my 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 favorite short is still the same one from the first episode that we said were our favorites. Um, and it's the bank. Uh, okay, bank so good. Yeah, okay. I still so good. love the bank. Uh. Uh, yeah, that is true. We talked about this already. Yeah, I was about to say. Uh, but we should at least mention it. We don't have to go that. Yeah, long. I don't. I'm not. Yeah, gonna, I'm not going to start it because you can oh, go back. Change. So I'll yeah. say mine too because mine's also the same. Okay. Uh, well, mine's the Amber Band, obviously. Okay. Yeah. Obviously. Just for so many reasons, like that one is the one that shows me the most. Like yeah. he's starting that transition to city, you know, the city lights or modern times type of movie. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. And yeah, for the bank, I really just love the dream sequence in that movie. I think it, it's just, it's just, and and the, yep. how he cuts back into reality is it's yeah. hilarious. So. And the fact that that was like uh, a short he had already done in the past, he was going yeah. to do that kind of thing, and like improving upon it. That's another great part of the thing. Uh, and for it's me, the immigrant, I already talked about it not like enough, but the main reason I picked it was the uh, scene I mentioned earlier. So, Blake, what about you? What's your? So uh, my old short? one was shoulder arms. And it's still okay. it's still definitely yeah, up yeah, there for me. Same. It's probably number two. But after watching all of them <laughs> that he directed, I think my favorite is actually a woman, dude. Like. It's, it's called, and the so, movie is called A Woman. Yeah, the yeah, woman's but, called A Woman, yeah. or Mademoiselle Charlotte. Charlotte. In French. <laughs> in French. But um, it's Charlie... So, in, in Charlie's Keystone days, he had two movies where he dressed in drag, and basically just used those movies to kind of show, like, how, how like, genders are kind of, like, kind of stupid. And, like, I really uh, actually like the second one, especially called The Masquerader, where, um... He dresses up like he's just. I think he's actually working on a movie set, and then he gets fired by the director. And I think Max Sin actually plays the director in this movie also, but I can't remember. Which is uh, he's the director of a lot of the Keystone comedies. He's the one that found Chaplin. Yeah, the one. He's the one that found Chaplin. But um, 
Chaplin comes back dressed as a woman in the Masquerader and gets hired as an actress. <laughs> and then he, the only reason he gets hired as an actress is so the director, because he wants to sleep with her. <laughs> like, he's so attracted to her that he wants okay, to sleep with her. And, they find, and then he finds out oh. that's Charlie at the end. And he's okay, like, okay. it's just, like, played like that. Yeah. But a woman is also kind of like that, where it's... But this one's, like, even more so where Charlie is in love with these with this woman. Like, he he's just sits... So, what, so it starts out with, like... Her dad, like so, his wife, her dad's wife, her mom, her mom falls, <laughs> her mom falls asleep on the bench that they're all sitting at, and her dad goes off and starts like womanizing, talking to other women, okay. and so Charlie comes and sits down next to the mom and daughter, obviously, and starts talking, and then they invite him to dinner, okay. <laughs> and so they go back without the dad because they are just like fuck him, and so they go back home and she cooks some dinner and all that, and then like his her her dad comes home with his friend that he wants her to marry. <laughs> Oh, okay. And so Charlie has to go and hide real quick. So he goes upstairs, and there's no way to get out. So what he does, he sees a dress on a mannequin, and he takes the dress down and starts dressing himself up as a woman. And then he proceeds to seduce the two men. In the and movie, it and, work it okay. and it works. And it works. And that's the whole thing. Like that's why I feel like it's literally just Charlie Chaplin saying like, this idea of like gender roles and gender norms, just gender in general, is kind of just really dumb. Whenever you think about it, <laughs> because like if if you're like so superficial that just seeing a woman makes you that horny and then like you okay. figure out that's a man like what does that say about you you know like, yeah, yeah. you can be attracted to a man too and him saying that in 1915 is just like really first of all it's kind of crazy that any director would do this because i feel like most it's kind of risky for it's it seems yeah. extremely risky in 1915 and just the like fact that like he actually seduces two men on camera it's like okay. it's kind of crazy i don't know it's and he does it three times in like his early career and i like all three of them but <laughs> But this last one was like a, it was like a conglomeration of like those those first two like this first one on is he improved on the idea and this one was it was SNA I, so oh, okay, okay. her dad's wife <laughs> her dad's wife her mom <laughs> so let's go to uh, the last question what's your favorite Chaplin movie yeah what's your top one um well I'm gonna mention my top three top, okay mention the, top the, three the, talk about your top one the, number three number two I'm gonna mention just. Okay. By name, All right. but uh, my number three is uh, City Lights. Uh, my number two is Modern Times, and my number one, as I've already said it already, is The Circus. <laughs> nice. um, and I, uh, really, what it boils down to, and Danny was talking about it earlier, it's in my opinion his funniest movie. And it's just a movie you can put on, you know, if you need something to just like entertain you and just have a good time. If you're just like, you don't have to be in the best, you know state to watch this movie like a lot of other I wouldn't say I can say you do that for a lot of the movies but I feel like for this one it's just definitely the best to you can just like anytime any place you can just watch it and just uh, love it um it has a lot of his best gags as I probably already mentioned and the ending's also amazing um yes. him getting left behind but they're also you know it's a tramp ending you know he, he still has hope and it's, it's still yep. a hopeful ending yet he goes yeah. away twirling his cane like oh yeah it's man it's it's just it's just yeah, I love it. <laughs> it was a great ending. Yeah. Too. No, we talked about it a lot throughout the podcast. Um, yeah. We do. It is. It's a good. It's a good thing because yeah, we're kind of, the way we want to frame this episode is this is going to be floating through films top three Chaplin movies, you know. Yeah. So, and the circus would does belong in the top three. I yeah. Don't know, so. And didn't didn't Ingmar Bergman watch well, it every year on his birthday or whatever? Yes. Oh yeah, that's in the commentary on the Criterion commentary. Okay. Ingmar Bergman watched this. And Fellini was a huge fan of the, of the circus as well. That makes so, a, way too yeah. much sense. <laughs> uh, no, the circus definitely was. It's a great pick. Uh, mm. What about you, Blake? What's your? You want to say top three and then yeah, I'll say I'll say my one. top three. All right. I first, for, first though, one thing I forgot to mention in the short thing: Charlie Chaplin is a very attractive woman. Okay, <laughs> going on, go, go, moving on. So, I don't know. This one's still so hard for me because. I'll also say my top three, and I think my two and three are the same as Luke's. I think it's Modern Times City Lights, and I think my number one is Limelight. I really love Limelight. Like, I think it's a beautiful send-off to just, like, one of the most influential, like, like, one of the most influential directors, or filmmakers of all time. Like, and obviously he did two movies after this, so it's not his complete send-off. And those two movies are pretty decent, honestly. I really like I really like King of New York especially. Yeah. But we should we should at least mention that movie in this yeah. episode. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but 
No, I really love Limelight because it really is just a perfect send-off to just Chaplin the man, kind of. And just his opinion on, like, passing the torch to the next generation, yeah. you know? Like, it really does just feel like him giving it away. Like, saying, this, and he made this the, is the he last... he made that movie as yeah. for that. He did, he did make the movie for it. It's very, like, it's not subtle at all. Like, this is exactly what he wanted to do. And I think it's a very powerful movie because of that. And I think it was made more powerful, like I've said already, because I've seen... <laughs> I watched all of his movies this month, like... So it... It was just like it was a beautiful send off to mm-hmm. to a man I spent so much time with this month. <laughs> and I'll go that that lead me to my list. And so my top three is three months overdue, two city lights, and one modern times. Nice. And before I talk about modern times, I thought it was interesting that I think all three of us put modern times and city lights in our top three. We did. And what's funny is uh, that before we did this rewatch of Chaplin. I didn't even love those movies. Like, oh, really? Especially oh, with, like, Modern Times. I, like, I, I appreciate it a lot, but I didn't I didn't really, like... I didn't love Modern it. Times either I, I, I didn't love I it. watched it. I liked it a lot, but I didn't love it. Yeah, so. and, then I, and then I rewatched it. I loved it this much, but, yeah. And we'll get into it again. That's, yeah. We can kind of talk about that with talking about my favorite, which was Modern Times. And the reason for that is it has... To me, it has just the most of everything. It's, like... It has the most of all of his other Chaplin movies in this one. It has... Uh, like, you know, Luke said it was his favorite favorite female character, but it has, like, to me, prop, maybe the best connection between him and a female character in the movie, um, Modern Times has. It has, the, in my opinion, I had mentioned earlier, but the best set piece, right? I mentioned it has my favorite score in it. No. It has, like Blake said, that kind of dual nature, especially of the second half, where it's a bunch of his shorts, right? Yeah. Like, you know, recalling, or, yeah, recalling a bunch of his shorts from his past. But it also has that great social commentary that's, it's always in your face, but it's never being shoved in your face, right? It's just always there, yep. you know? You can always read into it. And then uh, it just has all of that in one movie, and that's why I love it the most. Like, like City, City Lights to me is just a great – it's like a, a perfect movie. Yeah. But it does – maybe it doesn't have all of the, you know, gags. Like, modern, it doesn't have as much of the gags or as much as the uh, other parts of Chaplin. The cynical – like, this one is almost the in-between of his cyn- – where he starts to get very cynical in his later movies – and where he's still very vocal oh, in the early yeah. movies. Like, this is the in-between stage of modern times. Yeah. And that's kind of why I love it so much. It's like, at least in my opinion, it's the, uh, it's like the one that getting, has the most of everything of Chaplin. Yeah, he's getting cynical about the government side of things, but he yeah, still yeah. believes in, like, the, the, the goodness of yeah, people yeah, in this exactly. movie. Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. Whereas in Monster Over it's just like, yeah, he made his fuck. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> yeah, this one he's still a little more hopeful, especially with the ending, obviously, yeah. you know. He's still with someone else. And, you know, just... The Tramp's last movie, The Tramp's first words. It just has so much in it. It does, yeah. it's like, and you kind of have to watch like, and I was the same way with you when Luke was talking about how he didn't like it as much. Um, I was kind of the same way where, uh, going through this, I really thought it was I was gonna end up just saying Limelight, Monster Verdue were my favorites because, I think Luke mentioned this when he got here today when we were talking before how Monster Verdue was ranked as my number one before this, yeah. and so, I was kind of scared like I wouldn't like the silence as much, but. Modern Times, I feel like now I'm just going to get the most out of every time I watch it because sure. of what I've been saying. You know, I have so much in it, all of it. And, yeah, that's my pick, Modern, my modern Times. Uh, Deservedly so. And so that would make our floating through film top three Chaplin movies, The Circus, Modern Times, and Limelight. And that just, you know, it, it covers all three stages. All three stages, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, that's, a, that's a great top three list. Yeah. Um, but any last words on Chaplin? I think... Good we've movies. talked. We've spent five weeks talking about him. So yeah, good movies. Give him a shot if you haven't. Yeah, definitely give him a yeah. shot. But I think it's time to move on to talk about what we're going to be talking about next week. Um, it's another break week. We're going to take a couple of weeks of you know doing one one off episodes, and then we'll mm-hmm. go to Blake's mm-hmm. pick. Um, Tease Studio Ghibli. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Studio Ghibli. Yeah, uh, Blake already knows his pick. So. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so our next our break movie next week or our break. Uh, episode, episode, episode next week is going to be, we're gonna call it what? Pick a pick silent. A, pick a pick a silent. Pick yeah. a silent. <laughs> pick a silent movie. Stay in the silent genre. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Stay in the silent genre. And basically, we want to come back to this question. You know, every time, every once in a while, when we have breaks, is just pick a random silent movie you want to talk about. Or just pick a different category movie. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. We'll do different categories. Yeah. But we will still come back to the silence too. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. 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 So like. We'll have it with different genres, you know, like pick a favorite horror, pick a, or not even favorite, just pick a. Yeah, 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 pick yeah, a, yeah you know, yeah. it doesn't have to be favorite. It could be one you don't like. It can be anything. Oh, yeah. It can be yeah, anything it can be you want. one you don't like, yeah. So, um. Pick a terrible movie. 
Yep, yep. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, that could actually be a fun one too. Maybe we'll have to do that uh, next Breathless. week. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, oh, I just thought of this. We can talk about it now, right now. What if we did one more? Pick a movie you like, but you think the other people will on this podcast. Oh, <laughs> that's a good one. Oh, well, and we'll have to think about that. Yeah, we'll have to think about that. Because I already know some Michael Bay. I'm already thinking of some Michael Bay. Oh, Bans, no. So, ah. <laughs> that could be fun, though. That could be. It is fun when we disagree, right. so. Well, I like um, But, yeah. So, ne- but, yeah, but next week, pick a silent. I think all the ones we're going to do are actually, you know, bangers. Yeah, so. I think so. I think so, too. Uh, but, yeah, so, yeah, just go through really quick. What's yours, Blake? So, mine is A Page of Madness. Okay, in Japan. Madness. I can't remember the director right now, but, you know. Yeah, Page of Madness. Page of Madness. 20s. It's sure. called, it's considered Jap- Japan's first silent movie, I'm pretty sure, so. Yep. Well, and Blake, uh, what's yours? I mean, uh, what's uh, yeah. yours? Um, well, I picked uh, The Cameraman. Uh, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, silent movie, silent comedy, romance, rom-com, silent movie, kind of. It's a movie. It's uh, a movie. Starring Buster Keaton. He didn't direct it, though. Uh, it's directed by Edward Sedgwick. Um, and from what I can tell, he's kind of more of a studio director. But this movie, uh, it's not going to, like... It's more of a, It's a movie that you can just, like... It's it's short, but it's, like, it's sweet. It's fun to watch. It's just... It's a hilarious movie. And it's one I, I want to talk about. And my pick is one of the first uh, silent animated movies, like well, basically just silent anime, animated movies that came out, um, The Adventures of Prince Ahmed, which is uh, just has various stories from the Arabian Nights in animation, which some amazing colors. Like it's got amazing colors. Yeah, so I'm, I, really, I'm just picking this because I want to watch it again. It's been a while since I've seen it, and I'm excited to watch it again. So. Those are our three picks. And before we end our Chaplin series, we actually mm-hmm. should mention. Buster Keaton and Chaplin in the same scene. We did literally, we literally didn't mention that. Did we not we mention talk that about Limelight? Limelight? Well, we talked about it in Limelight, but we should at least finish that episode. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> like, well, we didn't even talk, we didn't mention it. We didn't even mention it in Best Gags. Like, yeah, we should have mentioned that in Best Gags. Or Best Music Moment, too. Yeah, that too. We kind of talked about but All right. We'll talk about it next week. Keaton. Maybe we can, Keaton? We'll spend some time <laughs> comparing Keaton to Chaplin. Maybe we'll make comparing it. them oh, wow. after seeing after seeing one oh, Keaton no. movie, we are experts. <laughs> no, no, no. Keaton's gonna get roasted. I've seen I've seen two before this. No, I like Keaton too. Like you don't have to hate one to like the other. No, okay, that's fair. Yeah, that's a good point. They, they're very different. They're very different. Really, really. Well, yeah, that's so. true. But we'll talk about that more next week. Um, it's been fun uh, doing yeah, Chaplin dude. Five fun. weeks. Uh, this is kind of what I wanted to do. This is why I wanted to do the podcast in the first place was just spending a lot of time on one subject. And I really like doing the French New Wave, obviously, but, like, the French New Wave is so big. It's yeah, you can spend five yeah. weeks on it, and it feels like you barely touched it, you yeah, know? Like, like we this did. one, like, <laughs> Chaplin, we went through almost... We all watched all the features, I'm pretty sure, even if we didn't yeah. review them yeah. all. So, like, that's possible to do in five weeks, you know? Um, but, yeah, it's been great. Um, next week... You uh, <laughs> until... Uh, how am I going to end this? Okay, until how next time, uh, help to catch you floating through the clouds... <laughs> <laughs>